Deep in Central Africa, rainforests are rapidly being destroyed. As the logs come out, the hunters move in. Great apes are under siege. Chimpanzees and gorillas killed for meat. Orphaned infants smuggled to the Middle East, destined for short, miserable lives in deplorable conditions. It is illegal hunting and cross-border trade in endangered species. But authorities do little to stop it. Following a trail of evidence, investigators build a case against smugglers, buyers, and the government officials who protect them. The Cairo Connection. These chimpanzees are survivors. Deep in their forest habitat, each began its ordeal when its mother was shot and killed, then sold from one dealer to another, but rescued and brought here. Sweetwater's Chimpanzee Sanctuary in Kenya is a rescue center that cares for dozens of chimpanzees. A tiny fraction of the orphans resulting from an onslaught of hunting in Central Africa. This story begins here. In January 2005, these baby chimpanzees were confiscated at Nairobi airport after arriving on a flight from Cairo. Six of them, together with four monkeys, were packed in a crate, stressed and dehydrated after being confined for days without food or water. One of them quickly died. The others were brought here to Sweetwaters and nursed back to health. X-rays reveal shotgun pellets lodged in their bodies. When they learned about this case, so many chimpanzees in one shipment, Karl Amann and Jason Meir decided they had to know more, to find out where the crate came from, where it was going, and who was responsible for this. And most critically, was this shipment only a small part of a larger black market trade in Africa's great apes. Carl and Jason were already deeply involved in the cause of saving these animals. Carl is an author and photographer for more than a decade. Jason as an independent investigator and chimpanzee activist. This is the flight manifest. From... Most of their work has been focused on the enforcement of national and international laws that are supposed to protect apes. All chimpanzees and gorillas are listed as endangered species under an international agreement called CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Carl and Jason were fairly sure they knew the origin of the chimpanzees, most probably Cameroon, a country that still has populations of great apes, but where illegal commercial hunting is now killing thousands each year. In the big cities of Central and West Africa, there's growing demand for bushmeat from wild animals. The meat of gorillas and chimpanzees is especially prized. Infant apes are frequently shot and killed with their mothers. But survivors are often captured by hunters and sold to dealers. When Carl and Jason reviewed the records of the crate shipment, their suspicions were confirmed. The crate had arrived from Cairo after being rejected by customs authorities there, but it had started its journey the previous day in Kano, Nigeria. Bound for Cairo through Khartoum with a passenger named Ahmad Ibrahim Abdul Shafi, holding an Egyptian passport. Checking further, Carl and Jason identified another passenger on the flights from Kano to Cairo, a woman named Heba Abdul Moti Ahmad Saad an Egyptian widely known as a wildlife smuggler. After the crate of chimpanzees was refused entry in Cairo and ordered to be shipped back to Nigeria, it was loaded onto a Kenya Airways flight to Nairobi that would connect to an onward flight to Lagos. But Carl and Jason found that on the return flight out of Cairo, the crate was listed as accompanied baggage of a different passenger an Egyptian woman named Wala Muhammad Ali Alua, Heba's daughter. Her crate was confiscated in Nairobi, but she was allowed to leave on the next flight to Lagos.
One Egyptian official came forward to explain what happened at Cairo airport. It's a box, six hours. And they, they don't know what is, what is the number of the box exactly. He states that the crate was never taken to the quarantine office and that other animals, gorillas and parrots, were allowed to enter Egypt. In Kenya, Dr. Joash Kerosi was the government's vet who made the decision to confiscate the chimpanzees. I was not very sure what I was dealing with because when I tried to ask for documents from Kenya Airways, the officer who had brought in, I think it was a security officer, he said I was just given these animals to be brought here and they are not for Kenya. Don't be bothered, they are on transit from Cairo to Nigeria. There was no address, there was no name on, on the crate and there was no clear markings. So he was not very sure what he was dealing with, but he told me that from the noise, I hear maybe they might be puppies, but the way they are packed is not very good. So can you come and check? I locked them up in my office because I was not very sure because these people were insisting on transit and I feared that I have not seen the recording, I have not seen the markings, I don't know what I'm dealing with. So I decided to lock them in my office, not in the cages, the normal way we do. We should not hide behind our mistakes. We should come forward and say, this, this went wrong. Kenya, we should admit, this is not the first time it has been happening. Carl and Jason felt certain that bushmeat orphans were now being trafficked out of Nigeria to buyers in Egypt and that the passengers Heba, Walla and Abdul Shafi were working together. This was a shipment that had obviously gone wrong for the smugglers. But how many others were succeeding? How many chimpanzees were successfully being smuggled to collectors? They were especially concerned that a shipment like this could have been accepted by airlines for international flights. Crude box with breathing holes that obviously contained live animal, but which had no required health certificates or CITES documents. And in no way meets the airline industry's minimum standards for containers with live animals. We have tried to uh, present our evidence and what we have collected in terms of interviews to Kenya Airways executive. So far they have denied to meet with us. They learned that Kenya Airways has been a prime carrier for traffickers into Egypt. Its employees and agents routinely accepting to carry undocumented wildlife shipments in substandard containers. Carl and Jason decided they needed to find out more about the market for chimpanzees and gorillas in Egypt. Who was buying them and why? On repeated trips to Egypt, posing as tourists or videotaping with a hidden camera, they found the evidence they needed. As Carl and Jason learned, it's now fashionable here for hotels and restaurants to display exotic animals. Private collections, circuses and roadside zoos that have chimpanzees and even gorillas. In their investigations, they photographed or found solid information on 26 chimpanzees and four gorillas kept in private collections. One chimpanzee recently fell off this island and drowned, the owner simply replacing him. Next to a cage of snakes, another baby sits alone, miserable in a dark cave. We have another island, bigger one. Okay. So uh, I collect uh, five, six chimpanzees, I'll put it together. This is exactly what the owner has done. Two more baby chimpanzees are now on display, having entered Egypt without CITES permits. Yeah. We were last year in February, and there was only one chimpanzee, and now it's mid afternoon and there's two more. Uh, small male and female. They said they came here just one month ago, but these are the two youngest chimpanzees we've seen so far in Egypt. In the Egyptian tourist resort of Sharm el Sheikh, two chimpanzees are locked in the private zoo of the Hosa Hotel. One baby chimpanzee, barely a year old, sits alone in a dark cell an object of amusement for visitors. How much chimpanzee cost like this if I want to get one? Dollar in Egypt? Dollars. Dollars? Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twen
So, so in dollar. Five thousand. Yeah. Mr. Ashraf and uh, you have in the house and uh, monkey small. Yeah. And three, three, three months. Oh, okay. Chimpanzee. Chimpanzee, yeah. Yeah, you can come back here in, uh, in Christmas here in Mustard Ashraf. You can come back in uh, Monkey Small. In Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, and I have seen the two chimpanzees here at the uh, Hosta place, but. Uh... What time is open? are definitely happening. They now have close to zoo here at the hotel. Uh, even the windows have been clogged up uh, where the chimps are. They turned the power off in the room. So, uh, the Immediately after Carl called the head of CITES in Egypt and reported the chimpanzees, he was told by the hotel that he would have to leave. Just returned to Cairo found all my spare film gone, uh, empty containers, open the camera, film has been removed as well. So clearly while I had a meeting with the manager last night, uh, they went into my room and uh, searched it, stole all the film, emptied the camera. The owner of the Tower Hotel out of view behind this brick wall and locked gates, hides a collection of endangered animals, including apes. 11 chimpanzees and two gorillas in deplorable conditions. This is one of the gorillas at this private zoo owned by Gamal Omar. He has another gorilla there, also an older female, and 11 chimpanzees. But this gorilla here is covered by a CITES permit. These three other chimpanzees, there's about eight adults, and these three others are babies that had just come from the wild. They're all clinging to each other. They were said to be brought in also by this Dr. Abdel Shafi, so smuggled into the country in May of this year. And they're all in very bad condition there. You can see there's only cement and metal bar cages. They had no food or water. He is this connected man, and it's quite easy for them to cover this up. If he wants to smuggle in a gorilla, you speak to the CITES official, and he writes a permit for you. There's nothing stopping this man from getting more. One of the local collaborators was able to get inside of this zoo and take some of these pictures. So we have pictures of eight chimpanzees and two gorillas, but this was in early May. When Jason went, went back, back the owner's son refused to let him take pictures or video footage, but claimed there were CITES permits for the three baby chimpanzees. Egyptian authorities were of little help. They confirmed that wealthy people bought apes on the black market, but filming permits were withheld and they refused to give interviews on camera. There's all kinds of stuff going on here again as far as uh, he wants to see the permit. But anyway, let me do my bit now because uh, this might never end. Uh, we're outside the Ministry of Agriculture here. Uh, we finally got permission to film in the street, but supposedly that doesn't mean uh, we can film interviews. Despite various meetings with various officials, including the minister, we have not managed so far to get anybody to agree to go on record on camera. Carl and Jason were now convinced that Egypt had developed a growing demand for great apes. A demand that would drive more hunters to kill mothers with infants. And would make it even more difficult to find effective ways to stop the bushmeat slaughter. And to save Africa's great apes from extinction in the wild. Back in Kenya, Carl and Jason searched through airline documents and confiscation reports. They found other trails of records showing repeated shipments of endangered apes to Cairo and elsewhere in the Middle East. Jason recalled reports of an incident in September 2001 when a chimpanzee and a gorilla were confiscated at Cairo's airport. Egyptian officials killed this chimpanzee and this gorilla by drowning them in a vat of chemicals, causing an international outcry. The records of the case showed that the animals had been brought to Cairo from Nigeria by an Egyptian woman named Rima Alua, yet another daughter of Heba involved in this gruesome trade. To Carl and Jason, it was clear that Heba was a central figure in the smuggling of apes to the Middle East. Carl, Mark you. She was mentioned in a report on smuggling issued in 1997 by the World Society for the Protection of Animals. I asked about who the dealers were, and the, the major dealer, um, all the time, the name that kept coming back to me was Mrs. Heber, who was an Egyptian lady who worked out of Kano and out of Cairo.
These chimps and gorillas would come from Cameroon across the border into Calabar. They would then be sold. They would then be transported, usually overland on a bus, up to Kano. And from there, they would then be sold on again to the uh, international dealers. So Bribing Nigerian well, officials to get false permits for export. Calabar, but she the papers would describe cargo as monkeys never as gorillas or chimpanzees. Based on the information he obtained from suppliers and crate builders, Pew estimated that Heber smuggled an average of 40 chimpanzees and eight gorillas every year. His report was published, but no action was taken. Questioning officials in Cairo, Jason confirmed that Heber and her daughters had been implicated in wildlife smuggling for years. They both live with their mom, who is the main trafficker in apes operating in Africa. They all three live in an apartment in Cairo, and we've been able to find documentation going back at least 27 years, proving that this woman has smuggled hundreds of chimpanzees and dozens of gorillas from Nigeria to Cairo. He also uncovered the identity of the man who had accompanied Heba on the flights from Nigeria to Cairo with the six chimpanzees. A medical doctor, Ahmed Ibrahim Abdel Shafi. I'm standing here in Cairo, standing in front of the office of this Dr. Abdel Shafi. We were able to find out that these female smugglers are working with this doctor. He's a pediatrician. And there are repeated stories from Egyptian officials stating that he's using the chimpanzees for organ transplant research. And it is a pretty serious allegation, one which should require the Egyptian officials to look into it and for the time being at least to close down this clinic. Carl and Jason now realize they had pieced together enough information to show that one family was responsible for a major share of the trafficking in African great apes to the Middle East. A Cairo connection operating for almost 30 years. Some of their shipments have been confiscated, but they have never been prosecuted. Jason traveled to Kano himself to find out what has changed since the Whisper report, now nearly 10 years old. In this hidden camera footage, a wildlife dealer explains his history with Heba. Hi, boy, you go take the parrot for before long time planted and the chimpanzee to carry go. Hi. <laughs> Jason then found the house owned by Heber's family, which also owns a transport business with offices in Nigeria, Cameroon and Cairo. The doorman at the house offered to sell Jason chimpanzees at a cost of 350 US dollars. What part of Nigeria do they come from? By Nigeria. What's he saying? What he said, he said this uh, chimpa, he said you can't get this here. He said let's in Cameroon. Cameroon Bawahana. Returning to Cairo, Carl and Jason could not understand how Heber's family could continue this trafficking in wildlife with impunity. They obtained this hidden footage of Heber and her family. Everyone knew about them. They were found repeatedly with smuggled wildlife, breaking the law. Why weren't they arrested? And how could gorillas and chimpanzees be displayed openly like this in private zoos? These animals have been acquired in violation of an international agreement that is binding on Egypt. The Hosa Hotel even promotes its ape exhibitions on its website, in flagrant disregard of CITES. The hotel has recently acquired three more smuggled chimpanzees, and until they are no longer able to be handled easily, they are used to earn five euros per photo with foreign tourists, but will then be locked up and new babies smuggled in. British Prime Minister Tony Blair is a frequent visitor to the Tower Hotel in Sharm El Sheikh with black market chimpanzees and gorillas in its private zoo. Egyptian authorities told Carl and Jason there were no laws in Egypt for criminal prosecution of wildlife smugglers, but they learned they are in fact laws that could be used but are simply not enforced. Officials also admitted that animals are bought on the black market for private zoos like this, supposedly supervised by the government and recognized as rescue centers. To Carl and Jason, that was a shocking admission. To say this kind of squalid confinement qualifies as a rescue center where smuggled apes can be kept and forgotten. If they do grow older and larger, and are no longer cute and playful, who will care for them? Like Sweetwaters, there are internationally recognized sanctuaries for great apes in Africa. 
places where these intelligent and highly social animals can live in a natural and relatively free environment. Here there is a commitment to care for each animal through its lifetime. As long as 50 or 60 years. A financial commitment of hundreds of thousands of dollars for each animal. Carl told the Egyptian CITES officials that if Egypt had any intention to live up to the spirit of the convention, they should confiscate these apes and repatriate them to a recognized sanctuary. Carl offered to bear the cost himself. In Geneva, Carl went to the CITES secretariat to find out why protections for these apes were not being enforced in Egypt. Are you satisfied with the results you got from the local management authorities who were investigating uh, supposedly this last case, uh, Egypt, Kenya, uh, Lusaka task force? Um, no, I don't, think, I don't think we are satisfied. I think there's a lack of communication between the, the various countries. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, particularly in this latest case, that um, you know, the animals appear to have been um, intercepted almost um, uh, at the airport in, in Egypt uh, and then were allowed to continue their journey. I don't think it's inappropriate that the, the animals should be returned, but they should be returned uh, under control. <laughs> These uh, countries and agencies have obligations under the convention. They should go and fulfill those obligations. Uh, and in he explained it was the responsibility of the Egyptian government no, to enforce the convention in its territory. But there are also cases that we see uh, from time to time where it appears that, that animals are being uh, removed from the wild almost to order for private collections. We don't have any for minimum standards, for example, with rescue centres because it's it's something that, that each country has to decide for itself. Um, As Carl sees it, that's like asking the fox to guard the hen house. In a place where rich and influential people operate above the law, doing as they please with endangered species. CITES seems to work well when nations are committed to enforcing the law. But the reality is that in this Secretariat, you have one individual that deals with enforcement of the Convention. At each conference of the parties, we submit a budget where we are looking for additional staff. The, the parties have not responded in a positive fashion. They don't want to pay. Unfortunately, as I say, the reality is that this, most members of the public, most parliamentarians, don't appreciate just how serious wildlife crime can be. But in the most extreme cases, where nations refuse to cooperate, CITES seems powerless. Carl went to the headquarters of Interpol, the International Police Cooperation Organization, to find out what role it could play in bringing wildlife traffickers to justice. Crime is crime and that maybe some of these priorities have to shift in the future as to where wildlife crime fits. We use a system of notices. There's blue notices, which is a lookout system, which is basically keep an eye on this person due to um, known past criminal activities. That is the way we identify people, what you may call flag people. It depends on, on the member country requesting a particular notice for a particular person. On the eco-message side, it's a member country will fill out the pre-formatted message. The message then gets sent into um, Interpol headquarters. So it's always pushing them to, don't forget to fill out this form to send it in because they don't, uh, some of them do not realize how important that information is to the overall. But this initiative would have to come from a government that is firmly committed to stopping trafficking. To date, Egypt has yet to issue a blue notice or eco message about these smugglers. Will it ever? <laughs> This area represents the best part of the Egyptian uh, story. It represents our civilization. The times where Egyptians used to revere and respect lives, they were mummifying most of the animals. They loved baboons. The baboons for them represents uh, uh, Tot, the god of uh, the patron of the scribes. It's another Egypt now. It's not Egypt that used to respect animals or life. I work for animal welfare and I can't tell you how badly treated I am in my own country because I'm working in this field. Sorry to tell you, this is the latest fashion. Anyone who opens a restaurant or a rest house on the desert has to have wild animals. Anyone, this is the latest fashion.
and we're very, we, I mean, spare our society for animal welfare, is very concerned about that. We signed the CITES. So I want to know if a, sh if a chimpanzee can be easily hidden. A chimpanzee is huge. How come the responsible, when they just traveled from Cairo to Alexandria, didn't notice a single chimpanzee and ask some question about it? So I think that this trading brings a lot of money to the smugglers and the person who closed their eyes. After following trails of evidence through months of investigations, Carl and Jason reached an inescapable conclusion. The international community is failing to protect Africa's great apes. As their populations are decimated by hunters, surviving infants continue to feed a thriving black market in the Middle East. With hidden cameras, Egyptians working with Carl and Jason were recently able to find people offering smuggled chimpanzees for sale on the busy streets of Cairo. And from the National Circus, which has a history of smuggling, major players in wildlife trafficking are still operating, now training another generation to take over.